Hi everyone, good morning and welcome. This is Seek Sustainable Japan and today we are talking about Japanese politics, something that we don't often talk about on the show, but of course it is very relevant for sustainability in terms of keeping better quality of life for people and value of planet in balance with profits. Governance is such an important part. And today we have an expert on Japanese politics and the elections. Uh, Donna Weeks, thank you so much for joining. All the way. Donna, you've had such a long and interesting career in Japanese politics. You were teaching for a long time at a Tokyo University about political science and peace studies.、Uh, you're now back in Brisbane, but you're still very much in the loop of what's happening in Japanese elections. How did you get interested and invested? In spending so much time on Japanese politics, where did that come from?、Um, look, I, it's, it's actually 40 years since I first went to Japan, went to Tokyo as an exchange student from my university.、Um, at the time,、uh, Japanese, the, the economy was quite strong here in Australia, and a lot of students were studying Japanese, and a lot of my friends were studying Japan and Japanese and economics. And I thought, well, Actually, to be honest, my political science lecturers were more interesting, so I went towards politics.、Um, and so, my exchange opportunity then was to actually study within the political science department at the university, and it really took off from there. I had some wonderful lecturers who took me under their wing、um, and really taught me、um, really a bit of what we're going to talk about today the factionalism of the LDP, how it works. Um, and, and I really just got interested in, on the one hand, you know, the economy is important, but I guess for a lot of us, we've got to understand how all the pieces fall into place. As you were saying in the introduction, you know, how do we make those pieces fall into place to make a better society? And it's not just the economy, as we so often hear, but it's the politics, the interplay, the power relationships that I, I came to learn were quite important. And、so that's, that's where I started, and that's what I've really been doing backwards and forwards over the last、uh, now 40 years. I hate to think of it like that, but yeah, it's 40 years. Wow, incredible. And I'm sure you've seen so many changes、uh, over the years since then. Now, today we're going to talk about the top seven、uh, candidates who are very likely to be at the top of the ticket、uh, for the president of the LDP、mm. who will. <laughs> Because the LDP is in power, they will become the prime minister.、Um, but let's talk about Kishida, Prime Minister Kishida, a little bit because he is stepping down and it was kind of a sudden decision.、Um, it sounds like、uh, there was a lot of kind of、uh, conflict within the party. There w a s things about not declaring how much、uh, donations you were getting during、um, the elections. And other k i n d of scandals were happening. He, he has, in my terms, he's, he's been a great prime minister. He is from Hiroshima. He came back and did the G7 here. He seems to have a very good international collaboration、uh, level. But in terms of Japan, there's a lot of resentment against the party and, and him in particular. And I think stepping down was a way to kind of.、Mm. Diffuse that, maybe.、Mm. What do you, what's your take on that? Yeah, look,、um, clearly, I think at one level, the pressure of trying to balance what he wants to do with the economy, what he wants to do with、uh, international relations,、um, came up against this constant you know, opinion polling that, that, that had、uh, its popularity down, the LDP taking hits all over the place because of.、Um, The money scandals. And I guess one reason why I've stepped back a little bit from the nitty gritty of the factional and numbers aspects of politics, I want to step back a little and understand this in a, in a broader picture. And I guess things like opinion polls、um, that have come, become so much a part of our politics wherever we are, it's the same here in Australia, it kind of turns politics. Into a kind of a horse race approach, you know, who's ahead, who's winning, and so on. And, and I think that's not a good way for us to deal with our politics. You know, we've got to dig much more deeply 
um, into what policies they're about. What are their philosophies? What kind of society do the politicians want to drive ahead? And what kind of society do we want? So for me, I think we've had this tendency over the last several decades now to, to have our politics determined by opinion polls. And in a way, this is what's happened with, with Kishida. So I'd say that's the first thing. He's probably just, well, without this popularity, without, without opinion polls going up, what chance do we have? So in one way, maybe he stood down thinking it's in the best interest of the party, let's just say. Now, when Kishida came back in, uh, came into power, um, uh, you know, three years ago, I think there was, it was a little bit of a surprise, to be honest, but it was only the fact that Abe's uh, factional numbers got behind him to, to put him into uh, the position. And I think, after the Abe era, which for a lot of us who want a gentler society, a, a more, a, a less militaristic society, shall we say, I think there was some hope that with Kishida, with, as you say, his background from Hiroshima, his very strong anti-nuclear weapon stance coming from that Hiroshima ex, um, experience, the fact that for some of us his Factional lineage goes back to Prime Minister Ikeda Hayato as well. Okay. And he was seen, I suppose, as at some level as being a bit softer, not as hard line as perhaps some of the other candidates. I think at that point there was some anticipation and he brought in a new capitalism idea for his um, economy, um, for the economy, you know, again, going back to his Ikeda lineage. There was, there was some hope and anticipation that well, actually, maybe Japan's just going to come back a little bit more to the midstream. Now, that really did change dramatically with the um, sitting of, of Abe, and I was really interested to see what's the change in Nikita, in, uh, in Kishida's demeanour as a result. Obviously, it was a huge thing for all of us to, to deal with, but the fact that I think that changed Kishida it brought him out to say, well, I've got to carry on the Abe legacy, which meant he had to go quite a distance, quite in a different direction from where he'd come from, what he was saying. Um, and I think from watching him over the last three years, he's tried to straddle that from Hiroshima, I have a nuclear, an anti-nuclear platform I want to pursue. I want to keep this Ikeda legacy going, but also now seeing where Japan has to go and the build-up of um, the defence and, and so on. It, it, it really, I guess, saw him have to really struggle, I think, with these two, two aspects. And I guess in the end um, he was unable to really do either of them well enough because he was divided into two aspects he could have pursued. Yeah, well, that, that makes sense. But also in Japanese politics, we might see him come back. Uh, we saw some prime ministers make returns, uh, right? Come back in power. It's, it might not be the end. And, and surely he will have some sway uh, inside the power of uh, the party as well. What do you think? Mm. Yeah. Uh, should we talk a little bit about who looks like to be the, the seven possible candidates for the next president of the LDP mm. and then that would automatically become who is going to be the prime minister right mm. um let's talk about some of the more obvious candidates first uh Taro Kono can you give us a little insight into his his uh political sure stance? yeah Look, and, and I'll I'll qualify this by saying we still don't know who is going to stand as yet there's still a formality of getting the they have to get their 20 um endorsed by 20 members of the parliament um that is still a few days away before they formally announce so like everyone we're, we're sort of speculating here and i guess my role as a political scientist i don't like to speculate too much we like to look back and make judgments rather than go forward and speculate too much. But look, there's certainly some um, names there that I think will be on the list uh, come the end of the week. Uh, Cornell is one of them. And, you know, I'm at that stage in my 
life where I was studying politics when his father was in politics, you know, the same as Abe's father was foreign minister. And so I'm going through this See whole thing. All right. So, so Kono, you know, he's he's been interested with trying to, as we know, digitise Japan, bring Japan into a, a greater digital sort of aspect. Um, he's sort of succeeded in some levels, but not other levels. I mean, it's it's kind of tricky to see where that's going to go. Um, he's probably of the candidates, uh, because of his background, probably um, the most fluent in English, which some people would say is an important thing to have uh, in a Prime Minister. Kishida certainly could, could engage with, um, on the international stage uh, in English. So there's there's that aspect that he likes to to bring forward. Um, he's a much more of a hawk in terms of defence than his father ever was. Um, so um, there is is that side of it uh, as well. <clears throat> he would give himself a good chance because he would think he is popular. But whether he can um, draw that that popularity from where he needs the votes is is another thing. Yeah. Um, also, he's. Let's talk about age a little bit because one of the things that LDP is saying, um, a lot of their polls are showing, is that people, even within the party, they really want a new, young, fresh perspective. Now, Kono is sixty-one, uh, which is one of the younger of the seven candidates. But we do have two that we're going to talk about later who are in their forties still. Um, so that's that's an interesting shift in in the election this time don't you think the young side this oh gee my my fourth year dissertation was about a group of young turks from the ldp at the time who said we don't need factions we can you know we're young we want this different approach to politics so that's 40 years down the track and in a way nothing's changed um you know, we, we've certainly got a couple uh, in that category uh, this time. Um, Koizumi, let's talk about him because he's quite popular with um, the public because his father was a popular prime minister for all different reasons. Now, what Koizumi Sr. did as prime minister, um, you know, was not considered the best in some ways, you know, privatising, uh, taking kind of a Thatcherite approach to, if you like, a, a kind of a neoliberal approach. Koizumi Senior, however, in, in more recent times, has become a really strong anti-nuclear advocate. And, and you know, it, there's some real um, contentions there with, with his former LDP. So, I mean, it's it's going to be, again, an interesting, interesting tension between um, Koizumi senior and and his son should he uh, become a prime minister it certainly does have uh, popularity to go back to those opinion polls some popularity in in trying to um, uh, draw the public's uh, popularity that could be a factor you know if they want to win uh, the next election he's i guess his his youth his age um gives him a sense amongst people that he's uh, being younger. I know he's a, an advocate of separate names for uh, married couples, which is quite an issue uh, at the moment. Um, when when people marry, women by and large have to take their husband's surname. He's recently come out to say that he's, um, you know, he, he prepared. His stint as environment minister got him some international coverage um, but people see him as being the son of, and that's not always the same as, as Kono Taro as it happens. You know, the, this this generational aspect of, of LDP politics at the moment, I think, is um, sort of annoying people a little bit. Um, the other young contender, shall we say, uh, Kobayashi, has, has come up. He's got quite a profile. Um, again basically on his youth, and I'm not sure that that's actually going to capture um, the factional numbers that they need uh, at this stage uh, to get the presidency and, and ipso facto, the, um, the prime minister. So Kobayashi is, is coming again from that idea that we need to take Japan forward again on an economic platform. Um, and of course, cost of living wherever we are um, is, is really what's affecting um, 
a lot of people. So that's where most people's ears will be. But whether he will ultimately bring the numbers together is, you know, it, you know, a lot of politicians at this stage, uh, some of these younger ones aren't thinking about becoming prime minister this time, but they're putting their hat in the ring to get noticed for next time or the time after, given that these elections roll around every two or three years. So it could be just a strategy in that sense too. It's really interesting, isn't it, to see, and, and of course, um, to have this idea that it's it's future campaigning. It's not just maybe it would be an outside chance to get um, mm. the bid this time, but it's, it's good branding um, yep. for the future bid. Um, one thing that stood out uh, for me, uh, Kobayashi is is turning 50 this year. Um, you mentioned uh, Koizumi as one of the uh, like outside favorites. Uh, he's launching his official YouTube channel uh, this Friday. He's officially getting in the race this Friday as well. He's 43. But according to uh, some polls, he has so much support, almost 30% of support. Um, maybe because of that family legacy as well, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, one thing about these two, uh, Kobayashi and Koizumi, they both have uh, education in America, like a lot of the top LDP do. Uh, mm -hmm. Koizumi went to Columbia and studied political science. Uh, Kobayashi, he was at uh, Harvard, I believe. Harvard Graduate School of Kennedy School of Government, uh, which seems a popular one mm. uh, with top government in Japan. Steve Kono also spent time, um, did his degree uh, in Georgetown, I think, in, in Washington. So, um, yes, there is a sense, I guess, that, that sense amongst the Japanese public that, that their politicians, if they've had that, well, we call it international experience, but it's by and large experience in the United States. That makes them an international person. It makes them um, somewhat special. And I guess given that the Japan-US relationship is at the moment possibly one of the most critical, then then it's important to think about how are these, how will uh, the Japanese Prime Minister, whoever he, or let's be optimistic and hope she in the future um, might be. Um, I, I guess it's how they were going to to work with, um, say, the next president of the United States. And of course, a lot of what's happening now, we, we can't think of it in isolation. We can't think of it without thinking about what's going on in the United States at the moment. Um, Trump remains uh, popular as a candidate, um, you know, amongst his, his people. And of course, we know that in Japan, there's a strong support for Trump uh, as well, which you know, may figure into the factional, um, deal. In, in a way, if this election, this presidential election was coming after the United States election, we'd, we'd have a better sense of where the calculations are. But given that uh, coming up as it is in September for the LDP leader, factoring in how they'll deal with either a, a Harris or a Trump administration, I think will inevitably play a part uh, as well. So someone who can um, work with and, and deal with um, the United States is going to be important. And I know we haven't got to her yet, but Kamikawa Yoko, who is also a likely uh, candidate, she's uh, a current foreign minister. Um, she's been, you know, working quite well on the international stage. Her, you know, um, her stint as, as uh, Minister for Justice a few years ago, you know, was was awkward and difficult and 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 so and yeah, has its has its problems. And notwithstanding, she's still a woman in the LDP. Um, she is able to speak um, quite uh, fluently and, and engage quite well on the international stage as well. It does come back to that question of whether or not Japan is, you know, well, the LDP is is going to be ready for uh, a female leader, which given that the factional alliances at the moment it's probably still a little bit too soon for that the 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 women will have to be ahead of their own factions before 
I think they can get the numbers as the system stands at the moment, unfortunately. Well, it, it was interesting to research a little bit about her. She's 70, which is uh, one of the older candidates, actually, of, of the group that's um, in the running right now. We haven't talked about uh, Toshimitsu Motegi and Shigeru Ishiba yet, um, but they're in their late 60s. So she's actually the eldest of the seven, it looks mm. like. Um, but um, she was part of the gender equality uh, group back in the past. She's been in three different cabinets, uh, Abe, uh, Suga, as well as Kishida. Um, so she's shown that she has political prowess. She has a lot of support within the party. Um, but, you know, when you look at, I don't know, this struck me as interesting um, that her hobbies are uh, Raggio Taiso and uh, doing ground golf and Nihon Buyo. And then you look at the younger candidates and they're doing marathon and they're young parents. Um, you know, that really stands out. If you're trying to signal that you've got a fresh approach as a party, it's, it's harder to choose an older candidate, even though, of course, choosing a woman would be very radical and very new for Japan. But yeah, the question in America right now is, is America ready for a woman president? And I think with the, the rise of Harris Walls, we're, we're seeing, yes, they're ready. Um, I don't know about Japan though. Japan in many ways seems to be a bit behind. Uh, you saw, can you touch on this a little bit for the Tokyo governor's race? Because mm. that, that was a big issue. And of course, a woman did win one of the most important uh, races in Japan. Mm. Yeah, look, that, that was interesting. Coincidentally, I happened to be back in Tokyo that week. Um, you know, I'm probably about the only person in the world who, who isn't a journalist who heads back to Japan to watch elections. But <laughs> I had some other things to do. But I, I was there at, uh, for the election, uh, the, the Tokyo election this time. Um, and look, that was interesting. I mean, I was really interested in it because, of course, it was between two, ostensibly between two women. Um, Koike, uh, the incumbent, and uh, Ren Ho, of course, with a long history in the Democratic, uh, the Democrat side of politics uh, in in Japan, and for quite a while there, it was going to be, you know, um, between those two, and Ren Ho in the end just got pipped by Ishimaru, and I'm glad we've come to this part of the conversation because. While I was there, what interested me is a how he sort of came out of nowhere, if you like. He he, he came from another prefecture to come and stand as governor of Tokyo. Now, in Australia, for example, if you're not a local, um, if you're not local to the area, um, you know we're not going to vote for you. What, what what's this guy doing now? Here he is. He, he sort of plonked himself and said, "Well, I'm going to you know come and do this whole." thing to Tokyo and he had that appeal to young people he did YouTube his uh, campaigning so I, I often go around and watch a fair bit of the campaigning as these uh, candidates go around um, was kind of dynamic he was trying to make a point he I think he did something like 200 of the um, you know speeches and, and campaign speeches around the the traps um, and he really really stood out now what struck me after that. Now, Ren Hall was, you could see, was clearly devastated. I mean, this really came up, I think, and surprised everybody. But what I was thinking about afterwards, and I'm, I'm sort of putting together an article about it because I was quite fascinated in terms of how we run politics as as a horse race almost, or, or how we, we ignore the important policy aspects for what's on show. Because Ishimaru in, in, the, in the week or so afterwards, in all these interviews and so on, people started thinking, oh, hang on, how did this guy get so high up? How did he come second? He's quite, he, he doesn't have a lot to say. He doesn't answer questions. He doesn't really have much in the way of policy. He just got himself up there in a kind of, you know, social media frenzy. And people sort of thought, oh, well, that kind of looks okay, without really going deep, more deeply into what he was about. Now, people knew who Koeka was, uh, people knew who Ren Ho was, um, but here's this bright, new, shiny 
person who's come up that that attracted people. Now, this is a direction I think that politics is taking that concerns me uh, greatly. And it doesn't mean I want to stay in in stodgy kind of old time politics. But for me, it's it's this is where I'm sort of taking a, a step back from the day to day of politics to sit and think about what this actually means for our politics in future, and and what do we as citizens actually what we should be asking for, what we should be seeking um, from our politicians. You know, they come and they they want our vote, but in between the elections, in between the campaigns. Uh, you know what are they what are they actually doing now? It seems to me that as a result of this in in Tokyo, I mean Ishimaru has himself, you know, talking about sort of just throwing your head in the ring to see what what comes next. He now wants to go and take on Kishida in Kishida's um, electorate in Hiroshima. Well, you know, and he said in one of his press conferences, well, you know, I'll just go and take on Kishida now. You know, I mean, why not? And I just thought politics is kind of not this sort of game. You know, and and we as citizens have just as much responsibility to make sure it doesn't become this sort of game that it seems to be coming. I mean, the, the, the Tokyo, other aspects of the Tokyo election, I know we're not talking about that greatly, but the number of candidates, the way the the electoral laws were abused, the, the, the posters and things, it was just, you know, if I wasn't actually there looking at it all, I wouldn't have believed it. You know, it was just such a such a sad thing to see that politics which is actually a noble profession i might say um you know has has become this and and to me it's that's where I'm, my work is heading now is is to ask ourselves these really big questions about how can we do better and it's not relying on on politicians they they're simply our representatives you know they're not they're not great celebrities, they're, they're our representatives working for us. So how do we rekindle that, the importance of our relationship with, with politicians that um, I guess I'll be, be working on in, in the near future? Those are such important points. And I think uh, we're thinking about that a lot in the American election as well. Not only who's the most popular, which is really important, but who can get things done. Yeah. Right. So when you look at these younger candidates, um, thinking back to uh, when uh, Koizumi was environmental minister and he was making a speech at COP and it was very clear he didn't really have the autonomy to talk mm. freely. And it, it made me really think, wow, who really has power about policy? It's not really the prime minister. It's not really the elected official who's talking often. Right. So that was one of the things I, I thought when I was listening to Kishida that it seemed like he did have more autonomy and freedom in how he was speaking with real uh, conviction. And mm -hmm. you want that as the public, but is that someone who's going to make the right policies happen, which actually make a difference in your life? It's such a balance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. most certainly. And I think that's... I mean, I, in, in political philosophy, we have this idea of the social contract, which has been around for many, many, well, centuries, really. And I just think it's now time for us to rethink it. And, and this is where my, my work is, is moving towards now, because it, and particularly now in the sort of world that we're living in, I mean, a lot of the big issues, and I know that, you, you know, you talk about them on your program all the time. And, and I think, you know, I do just want to um, reiterate um, my congratulations to you on getting so many programs up. And, you know, I, I remember when you first started this and I know that your work that you've done um, on this program has really made some fundamental changes in the way that, that A, I live, but also how I've taught my students um, in terms of what is sustainable. Now, the climate change, sustainability, peace, these are not the preserve of any political party. This involves all of us. And this is why it's important for us now, whatever our age, um, you know, we talk about young people disengaging from politics. Well, they're probably disengaging from this kind of, you know, factional stuff that's coming up. Um, it's only people like me who really have that much interest. We're, we're sad people. But, but young people, you know, it's climate change. It is sustainability. It is, um, 
you know, both in Australia and Japan, the cost of living. You know, the, the, the generations coming through after my generation, you know, are in many ways doing it much harder. Now, traditional political parties aren't quite responding to that in the way that, that really they need to. And I think as voters, um, you know, in, in Australia, voting is compulsory. Everyone must turn out to vote. And this was something I used to, to talk about with my students quite a lot in Japan. You know, they don't have to. And I said, but because, and there was this sense that, well, my vote doesn't matter. I said, well, okay, if your vote doesn't matter, if you're not voting, what are you doing to try and get politicians to hear what you're saying? Do you go out and join, uh, go and listen to their, their street campaigns during elections, you know, when they're on top? No, why would I do that? I said, well, go out there, show that you're interested, so, so that they know that there are young people there. So some of my students, you know, we would take them um, to some of those events and, and get them to speak to the politicians just to change their, their minds a little bit. Um, not far from my campus uh, in Ariake, uh, when I was in Tokyo, every um, constitutional day, uh, 3rd of May, which is public holiday in Japan, um, one of the parks there was, was the site of the probably the largest gathering of people who want to uh, preserve Article 9 of the Constitution. And for the, most of your uh, audience will, will know what that is, of course, but that's the, the critical article in the Constitution that says Japan won't go to war, that Japan will maintain uh, peace and so on. And and this is also critical in who becomes Prime Minister and all the rest and, and recent uh, Japanese political directions. But I took my students to that sometimes. I said, look, I know it's a public holiday and I know you don't want to come all the way down. But I said, look, it's just next, literally next door. Let's go and have a look. Let's go and see what people are doing in order to, to convey their views to politicians, not just... Um, on voting day, but what are we doing? It is up to us. Now, prior to COVID, that assembly got, I think, around about 70 or 80,000 people. Post COVID, the last couple that I went to uh, before I came home, you know, it was, was down on numbers, but social media expanded that quite a lot as well. So there, <clears throat> there is ways to, to engage the public in politics that take us just beyond these factional numbers and deals. And, and if we can get engaged in what that politics can be, you know, as I said, it, it, it is important for things like climate change, for sustainability, for how do we, you know, to, to implement all the things that you've been um, talking about and doing on your program over the years. You know, that's, that's politics as well. And, and how do we keep pushing that? And, and how do we make people our representatives? They're just our representatives. They're not, you know, super untouchable figures. They shouldn't be. Um, you know, and that's what's really important. And I guess, you know, over the years, sort of as a result of talking to you and working with you over the years and, and just rethinking what we can do with our, our politics, you know, this is where my work is going now that, Sure, it's important to know who the PM is going, the Prime Minister is going to be. But how much of a role do we have in that and what, and what we should be doing and how do we get that across and, and be much more engaged? Because some of these issues are just too big and too important to leave to politicians. You know, it's, it's one way I would put it to the students. I appreciate everything that you're saying, Donna, so much. And it's been such a pleasure having you at events that I've tried to host, like Women Inspire, uh, where we had all women speakers in rural areas as a way to revitalize. And we only did that for a year, but I would love to revisit that again someday. And it was great having you as a part of that. And I remember you saying how you were taking ideas from the shows that I was doing mm. and uh, trying to incorporate that in your classes. And one thing you said really stuck, stuck out about how at the beginning of the course, you'd have a lot of students with uh, single use pet bottles and at the end you didn't have any. And so you felt like there was a bit of progress there. Uh, that's, that's great to mm. hear. And I, I, I said before we started, I feel like these talks, including this one today, 
the Sikh Sustainable Japan is like a point in time in Japanese history. And we're talking about what the situation is now. And hopefully it's relevant years into the future as people look back and hear from experts like you about what's happening on different topics, which definitely connect to sustainability. So mm -hmm. that's awesome to have you on. Cool. Uh, wh why don't we talk about the next uh, woman in the top seven? Uh, we haven't mentioned quite uh, yet. Sanae Takeuchi, Takauchi, Takaichi. Sorry, Sanae Takeuchi. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about Takichi. Look, again, she's quite ambitious for herself. I mean, I think she's even perhaps positioned herself as um, Japan's Margaret Thatcher. Make of that what you wish. Um, you know, she's... It's almost very hard to use the word conservative these days when we talk about some of these quite radical right-wing people, I think. Um, we, we, and again, you know, this is again changes in politics, the, the, the left-right binary that we're in, the, the conservative progressive binaries that we find ourselves in, again, makes politics out to be some kind of, you know, horse race kind of thing. All of us, I think, if we stop and consider our values, might have bits from there and bits from there and bits from there. And so, and so do our politicians, um, the ones I've worked with, the ones I've known. But <clears throat> Takeichi is, is going very hard on a, on a radical conservative program, if I can say. You know, she, she would um, seek revision of the constitution. She's very much a protege of Abe. Um, and would continue um, down that that track, I think. So, um, she's uh, she writes. She's had a, a, a couple of books. I think she's just about to publish another one, which people are seeing as her. You know, a lot of politicians will publish books, whether they they've written them or whether they ghost written is another part of the story. Um, I have a whole bookshelf here of politicians' books from you know, the 1980s telling us all about their policies. And, and it's often a signal that, that this is what they would want to do if they became prime minister, lays out their policy platforms and things like that. And, and uh, in the last uh, presidential election here, I had uh, Takeichi's book as well. And um, it's, it's quite a, it, it would continue taking Japan down the Abe pathway and, and whether or not people, want, I know that's, um, was, was Abe's directions were highly regarded with international partners, um, Australia for one, um, but it, it, there was a real disconnect with, with the Japanese population about going down that path. And I think this is what, you know, might just keep her out of um, the race because she's quite well known for being that very radical. I mean, if, if if they were to choose a woman, the pragmatist in me would say they'd probably choose Kamikawa before they chose Takeichi simply because of her very, um, as I say, radically conservative. I don't, because she's, she's not conservative. She wants to change lots of things, but very much uh, on, on the right, sort of right-hand side of uh, politics, I think. So, um, again, she's she's in her 60s um, and even with that has been elected nine times. So back in the 80s and 90s, it was very easy to pick the next Japanese prime minister. It would usually be the number of elections they'd, they'd successfully stood for, the number of times they'd been elected. They usually had a, a path through the ministries and it was kind of, well, it's your turn now. But these days it is a little bit different and you do have to, to juggle. And, and the fact that um, members of the party outside the parliamentary um, party can have some input to the voting as well makes it really, you know, juggling all balls. And out of that might come a compromise candidate that we that we don't know yet. You know, it's it's quite interesting. So it really seems like this is the week when a lot of candidates are are mm. making their yep. their announcements officially. So we we're just guessing on who the top seven uh, possible candidates are. 
but we might be completely wrong. We might have missed someone, but these are likely yep. going to be within these uh, seven. Let's talk about uh, Toshimitsu Motegi. Okay, well, again, under the old LDP, Motegi is someone who would have anticipated that because of the career path he's taken through the party, you know, it would be my turn at, at some point. Um, and so, you know, he's held some of the significant um, positions in the party. He's been, um, you know, spokesperson uh, at times. Um, He's the one, as Kanjicho, as, as, you know, one of those significant positions in the party where he might try and pursue and push particular policies and, and so on. It's the, the positions he's held previously would be considered some of the significant um, powerful positions in the LDP that as the party president, the party leader, um, members of the party would have expected uh, he would have had, which might edge him ahead of some of the others who've still only held positions at the ministerial level. To hold these two or three key party positions is often considered you know, really important as far as the experience goes uh, and, and what he can do. Again, I don't see many of these people like Modegi or Hayashi, who we might talk about as well, stepping out of that you know, I, I think the Abe influence is probably going to remain. We've seen with Kishida, he couldn't get out from under the Abe shadow. And, you know, Abe changed the rules, you know, from, from only having two two-year terms to, to extending that to th first to three-year terms and then going beyond the two-year, the, the two-term limit to another term. I think for the foreseeable future, um, even amongst the, the candidates, aside from Ishiba, um, all of them will still be under the, the Abe shadow, I think, for some time to come. And, and it's going to take a lot to move um, out of that. And particularly by, I think, you know, by next year, once the election comes around, that's about the time that um, uh, Yamagami, I think, the... the um, will be going to trial for um, the murder of, of Abe as well. So that's going to, to float up again and people are going to have that sense of um, sympathy, I guess, is going to come come out again. Uh, you know, all those factors might, might come into it and I think that might be um, used as well. So it's, um, yeah, I, I, I just still feel that the... Uh, for better or worse, the, the shadow of Abe, people will want to continue his legacy. People will want to see that. Even though I think there was a point at which, just a few years ago, we might have pulled back a little bit from the very pro-military line that, that Japan was going down. You know, Suga um, or, or Kishida might have been able to pull back, but I think the shadow shadow of Abe, I think, will uh, will keep things you know, in that direction for a few years yet. Yeah, um, talking about Abe a little bit, you've probably got lots of insights. Um, he really changed the party and Japanese politics. He's well remembered abroad. Uh, people often talk about him. He, you know, is, is remembered as, I think, uh, being next to Mario to accept the bid for Tokyo Olympics. Do you remember that scene? And yep. so he had that kind of um, easygoing kind of join in the fun side, mm. but also he, you know, is connected, even his murder is connected to the scandal, which Kishida is stepping down for, for uh, people taking donations, especially from this uh, church, which is maybe not really a church. And mm. Kishida has worked hard to declassify that church, which is more like a cult and telling people in the party to cut their ties. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of positive, but also negative about Abe's legacy and uh, definitely still connected to current politics, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, certainly. And I mean, I have to say that it was Abe coming back or the LDP regaining power in 2012 um, 
which actually got me thinking about I probably need to get back to Japan to see what's going on now. I, I did again because I'm probably the only election tourist in the world. I did happen to be back in, in Tokyo to watch the 2012 election. Now, this, of course, was the very important one, was the one after um, the triple disaster in Tohoku. Um, people were clearly disappointed with, with the way that, you know, it was the Democratic Party in government, but people were, were so quick to blame them uh, led by Abe, I would say, you know, the, his his Nihon o um the slogan that they used for that particular <clears throat> election, you know, let's let's take Japan back, had a double meaning, you know, it was like, well, let's, after this disaster, let's, you know, pull Japan together again. But, and I still remember this, and I think this was the, the uh, trigger that made me want to come back to Japan more long term. Uh, it, it took a few years to get back, but I eventually got back. We were sitting there, I was with my friends, and we were watching the press conference afterwards, after the election, after it was clear that, yes, indeed, the LDP were back in power in 2012. And it was about 11.30, 11 o'clock at night, I think, his press conference. And he sat there and he said, well, now this gives us the mandate to change the constitution. And my friends and I, I said, did he just say what I thought he said? And my friends who were not LDP supporters, I, I would say, said, yeah, where did that come from? Now, this was something that had not been spoken about in the election at all um, and in any part of the campaigning. I thought, now, there's something going on here. And, of course, subsequent years, uh, Abe's idea of Nihon o Torimodosu became quite clear. They went back to Meiji era leaders, you know, the late 19th century, early 20th century leaders, when Japan was, you know, becoming a big you know, power. Um, and I thought, now this is going to be an interesting few years if, if Abe is able to see that through. So it was in fact that, you know, I can't remember, I, I can't believe I remember these things, but it was in fact that particular press conference that made me think something is about to change uh, in, in politics. And indeed, so from effectively from 2012 um, through to the present, and that's why we say, you know, Abe's influence is going to to continue now you we can't talk in hypotheticals very much either but i mean if he hadn't been shot if he was still alive certainly his he, he may have come back to the leadership again himself you know for a third time or, or some such um he, he probably would have maintained quite a, a strong uh factional um power and indeed what's to say how much of this tie up with the Korean religious group would have actually put him in, you know, um, give him less influence is is hard to say. But the fact that this all came to head once he was shot, once he was killed, um, and the way the parties tried to deal with that since, there's still a great scepticism in the public. But what's that, what that's actually has done is is made the public more skeptical about politicians and unfortunately probably back to well what's the point of following politics or you know these politicians aren't really listening to us anyway so we're at a really interesting um, juncture i think in in politics at the moment i mean as i was thinking about today's talk with you i thought you know sometimes the beach cleans that we go and do and we find those i thought what's the best way to explain this you know we find those fish nets and they're they're, they're just all tangled and there's bits and pieces in them i just feel that over the next few weeks what i'll be doing is taking one of those great big balls of you know fishing fish netting and and so on and trying to to unpack it because that's really kind of where we're at with with this given the overlay of the u.s presidential election as well i mean it's you know it's for me it is a fascinating time but you know we we can't necessarily um put uh put our predictions out there at this stage you know yeah. I've just asked the audience a question. Now it looks like we have a few people there. Uh, which candidate do you think should be put into power as the next prime minister in Japan? It'd be interesting to hear your insights as well. Uh, Donna's got the very political scientist. I'm not going to make a prediction 
kind of theory here. Um, I appreciate that as well, but it'd be fun to hear what the audience is thinking. Um, now there's one more that we haven't really covered, and he might be one of the front runners, uh, Shigeru Ishiba. Mm, mm. Can you talk about him a bit? Well, Ishiba is kind of the candidate that I think a lot of people would like to have because he's not, oh, but he's, he's kind of the, the LDP's internal critic. Um, some would go to, as far to say he's, he's kind of the LDP's conscience at the moment. Um, he's probably again in those who do you want as next Prime Minister polls that the, the newspapers do um, at the moment. He's, he's probably generally tops that um, poll, interestingly enough. Now he himself, you know, again, he's been elected 12 times uh, or something. Or, although interestingly, he's, he's a few years younger than um, Kamikawa. He's uh, still only about 67, 68. Um, he's held, again, the range of, of political roles uh, and ministerial roles in the party that would have given him at another time uh, a certain trajectory to become uh, prime minister. Sometimes in the past, his, um, you know, again, he's he's a member of the, the Liberal Democratic Party. We can't get away from the fact that they all do have this conservative sheen uh, about them. But, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 70s and 80s, when I was studying, um, you know, with, of, of when I was looking at the party history, there's always been these um, two main streams within the Liberal Democrats and it's, it's often called the mainstream and the anti-mainstream and it might be about relations with China or not um, China or, you know, there's there's always been these, uh, uh, apart from all the myriad factions, they've always sort of coalesced in, in two sort of pro and anti views and I guess that's what sort of keeps parties bubbling along a little bit. Now, Ishiba... Um, look, it would be interesting to see him come in as Prime Minister. If he'd become Prime Minister, say, you know, 10 years ago when I think he first sort of thought about becoming Prime Minister, uh, you know, it, it, it probably would have been different. But you, I just get a sense in listening to his um, interviews and the way he comes across, he actually engages reasonably well in live television with the audience and, and so on and, and, you know, the question and answer sessions. And that's why he has this, he seems to have picked up over the years, I guess it's sort of explained some of his popularity with, with the general public. Perhaps there's something that's come with age. I mean, I think when we all get a little bit older, we sort of reflect and think, well, how would I do things differently? I just get that sense that he he would be a different prime minister now compared with what he might have been 10 years ago and i i think he might be a, i think he's got enough experience you know having been elected you know 12 times where as we we're talking earlier about kishida having that problem trying to straddle the what i want to do versus what i must do i think my my sense is just looking watching Ishiba quite closely over the last few years, he just might have that, what would you call it, a, a, a kind of a calming or a, a kind of a stabilising of not being quite as radical as as what Abe had planned, but but not, you know, being entirely conservative at the same time, you know. So I think, you know, to answer your question, do I, do I, um, who would I like out of this life? If, if ideally I'd like a woman, but we know that the politics of you know the world at the moment is is not in favour of that. I, th I think a, a young woman, you know, Noda is is another one whose pol political career I've, I've followed quite uh, closely. Um, I guess of of this current crop, if I wanted to feel that, what would you call it? Almost like the safest pair of hands over the next couple of years it, it would probably be Ishiba surprisingly um, because um, now he mightn't have the factional support but getting back to my earlier comments about engaging the public again in politics if he's sitting there with that sense that people get that sense that he engages with them 
that he's not doing it necessarily. Look, there's also all sorts of things or problems with Ishaba as well. I'm not going to say he's, you know, no, no candidate is perfect. But just watching where politics needs to go, Japanese politics needs to go at the moment and, and who could sort of just bring a little bit of stability to that, that element, I think probably Ishiba could possibly be the best candidate for now, I would think. There you go. You've done what I said I wouldn't do. You've made me pick somebody. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so we were talking a little bit before we went live about signaling, and I think this election is a lot about signaling, uh, not only choosing who's going to be the president of the LDP now, who will be the prime minister, but it's really about the election next year. So they want to choose someone that the general public feels happy to back because that means their party will stay in power, right? Uh, can you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, sure. This is this is interesting because when when a candidate presents himself or herself to the electorate, it's quite different from having to present herself or himself to the people in this instance who are going to elect him, which are, as we said, you know, the factional leaders. It's it's the factional leaders, not so much the factional members. The factional members will be told who to vote for. Um, but it's also just in the in the first stage of the voting that that um, element of the local members out in the prefectures, and they get to uh, have a proportional vote as, as well. So there is that. Um, it's quite different from the election campaigning itself, where they're trying to appeal to uh, people in their electorate. There is that balance between what sort of traditions do I bring? What sort of, um, you know, will I be upholding the values of the Liberal Democratic Party, however we might want to decide what they are these days? Is it safe to, to go away from the Abe-influenced party can we convince people to think about coming and standing, going down a different path at the moment? It's 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 quite tricky while ever Albert's legacy uh, remains. But that certainly there's that sense of uh, amongst the various candidates of wanting to appeal to the broader electorate at this stage. Because as you say, you know, whoever wins this becomes, whoever's president becomes prime minister and will lead um, to the next election, which is scheduled for next year, but could of course be a little bit earlier. Um, so again, speaking to my students over the last eight years or so from teaching, you know, they all have this sense that, well, the LDP only listens to the older people anyway, and it's only the, the, the silver, which a little bit of silver here, but, you know, I don't vote. Um, you know, it, it's a very much a silver democracy, as a lot of students would talk about, that the LDP was really only appealing to um, those people, the older people who will vote. So whether or not Koizumi, Kobayashi can appeal to the younger people get them to vote as well um you know that's that remains to be seen but they're all going to say you know it's interesting that you said you know uh kamikawa's um interests include rajo taiso i think all of us you know who have been parked around 6 30 in tokyo will see that that sort of going and that's got a kind of appeal i guess for for some people um you know koizumi coming out and saying he's in support of um uh, keeping your surname once you're married and so on. You know, that, that is a really important issue for, for a generation as well. So um, it's it's hard, I guess, to, to try and sort exactly where the appeal um, should be. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that is our hour. That went way too fast, Donna. Thank you so much for joining and adding all of your amazing insights. Um, we've got a, a couple comments. Uh, Darren on LinkedIn, thanks for joining. He says, I do like Koizumi's understanding of the importance of a circular economy. Yes, the understanding and the focus and the transparency about mm -hmm. the need to balance environmental needs as well as economic needs is certainly something we want to hear more about. It's such a pressing issue. We're having yet hottest ever weather all over the world, including Japan, lots of environmental issues, right? Uh, Mr. Miyazaki, 
admitting I'm lost in Japanese politics since leaving the country in 2012. However, I also liked Mr. Mm -hmm. Koizumi. Yeah. So I think it's true. Koizumi is is hitting a lot of interest in mm -hmm. the international stage as well as a lot of younger people who like his proposal, like you said, about keeping your name. Uh, just like Harris Walls in America, the biggest issue is mm -hmm. it's abortion and women's uh, health care. You know, there's a lot of issues about cost of living, which is really hitting, especially younger people, really hard in Japan. So it'll be really interesting mm -hmm. uh, to see how transparent and clear uh, these electors or these candidates are in terms of uh, what policies they intend to do. Uh, are Japanese politicians usually forthcoming about that sort of thing, Donna? Well, you have to, well look, it, politics has to change. You know, the, the, the candidates, it, it's the same here in Australia, you know, they're pursuing you know, the same old things that, that so many of our issues now are beyond party lines and savvy politics, well, I don't even want to use the term savvy politics, thinking politicians will engage their electorate and also, you know, engage with the issues in, in a bigger way. I mean, party politics has become too professional, too much game playing and I think you know, it's all come comes down to numbers and, and you know, we've, we've sort of put too much of the science into political science and I want to bring back the political from political science. You know, we've got to be much more political and that means much more engaging and, and you know, I'm very grateful for this opportunity because I don't often get a chance to speak for an hour. But, you know, it's, it's this level of engagement that is actually, you know, really, really important, not what yesterday's opinion poll said. So my thanks to you, Joy, for, uh, for again, for this, this wonderful program that you have. And, uh, let's keep on doing it. Yeah, and I'd love to follow up uh, once we get closer to the election or even after a candidate's chosen and then talk about how it's it's changing in the party uh, with the new president of the party and how that that's shaping Japanese politics. It's always a uh, kind of a moving goalpost, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Donna. It's been great having you on. Thank you everybody for joining. And Thank you very uh, see much. you next see you time. Soon. Yeah, thanks, Donna. Thanks, everyone. Take care.